right, so we are going to get started. We have a wonderful guest speaker today who is our friend and colleague, uh, Professor Hannibal Hamlin. And Hannibal is a professor of English at Ohio State University. And he is the author of three major works which are related to our seminar. One of them, I think this may, might have begun as his dissertation, mm -hmm. is called Psalm Culture and Early Modern English Literature. And I shamelessly stole from it in my reading of Psalm 137 last week. So this is a wonderful book. Um, he also edited the Sydney Psalter, that is the collection of literary translations by Sir Philip Sidney and Mary Sidney, uh, which is really just an extraordinary effort by the Sidneys, but also by Professor Hamlin. <laughs> and then he wrote this wonderful book called The Bible in Shakespeare, which is, has chapters on various plays and a great introduction about the different editions that Shakespeare might have used and what they meant and how they were used in the Renaissance period, plus lots and lots of articles. So please join me in welcoming Professor Hannibal Hamlin, why Macbeth should have stopped worrying and loved the Psalms. Um, the, the, uh, the reference, um, clever or not, is to Dr. Strangelove, the subtitle of which is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Um, and uh, that may seem a very oblique illusion, and it probably is, but there is a connection which I'll come back to later on. For the most part, though, um, we can leave that aside. And I wanted to start by, by talking about um, ways of reading the Psalms. I noticed from, I, I was, I enjoyed very much um, the earlier sessions, Julia's two sessions that she led and also Robert Alter's. Um, and the Psalms, uh, it seemed to me often you were, you were, and, and you know, wonderfully, the Psalms are, are rich, wonderful texts, um, and you were delving into um, some of the most interesting ones. But um, it, there are different ways of approaching Psalms. One of them is, is as complete songs or poems, which you were often doing, looking at individual ones and reading them together and thinking about what the topics are and, and uh, how, they, the, how they work in different ways as poems. Um, but the, there are also, like most of the texts in the Bible, you can also read them selectively. And uh, so here, for instance, is just a random sampling of verses from the Psalms that have had a long cultural history of their own. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, except the Lord build the house, their labor is but lost that build it. Thy word is a lantern unto my feet and a light unto my paths. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. O oh, taste and see how gracious the Lord is. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And then the bottom one, which is a little obscured on my screen. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All of these, as I say, have a life of their own in different ways. Um, they lodge in people's heads like so many other individual scriptural verses. Some of them have particular functions. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, is most strikingly um, the last words of Jesus on the cross um, in at least two of the gospels. Um, o Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise becomes the opening of the responses in the English Book of Common Prayer um, for the service of Matins. Um, and then some of these others um, be become popular in different ways. Another, actually one way in which some of these verses become pop become popular on their own or lodge in people's heads, many of the anthems or motets that were used in worship services were musical settings of not usually whole psalm texts because that would be too long. Often they excerpt um, a verse or a few verses and set that for, um, for a motet. So, so all that to say simply that there are different ways of reading the Psalms, some of them as sort of integral single poems, some of them as sort of bits and bobs that pop up in different places. I also wanted to, uh, this, is, this is a famous um, bit from St. Basil, but this idea was, was repeated endlessly over the centuries, well through the Renaissance, Shakespeare's day. And essentially it's about the, the nature of the Psalms as a biblical book that has a special status. Um, Basil writes, all scripture is inspired by God, it is useful, 
composed by the Spirit for this reason, namely that we men, each and all of us, as if in a general hospital of souls, may select the remedy for his own condition. For it says, care will make the greatest sin to cease. Now the prophets teach one thing, historians another, the law something else, and the form of advice found in the Proverbs something different still. But the book of Psalms has taken over what is profitable for all. It foretells coming events, it recalls history, it frames laws for life, it suggests what must be done, and in general, it is the common treasury of good doctrine, carefully finding what is suitable from each one. The old wounds of the souls it cures completely, and to the recently wounded, it brings speedy improvement, on and on and on. I mean, the idea essentially is that, I mean, even though the Psalms I mean, we might think that one of the things that distinguishes the Psalms is that they are songs, that they have a, um, a formal status that's different from much in the Bible. Well, there are other songs in other books. But for many over the um, uh, first couple of millennia, the Psalms was almost like a precy or an epitome of the entire Bible. So that everything you might want from scripture was compressed into the Psalms, not just beautiful poetry, but doctrine, prophecy, history, law, everything you might want. Um, and I think that's important in terms of, of why the Psalter becomes so, um, is so popular, becomes so well known and so often quoted. Ways of reading the Bible. This is another sort of general um, comment here that might be useful to think about. <laughs> This is, um, this is, I think this has come up in, early, in your earlier sessions, but the Book of Common Prayer in England um, offered various guidelines for how to read the Bible. First, you can see actually um, on the left there is the table and calendar expressing the order of Psalms and lessons to be said. Um, and it gives you an idea of how to run through the Psalter. Um, but then if you go over to the right, it tells you how the rest of Holy Scripture should be read. And if you leaf on in the Book of Common Prayer, you can find various tables telling you which Sunday, which day of the week, which service, um, and for each of those, which biblical chunks you should be reading. The idea being that you get through not the entire Bible, but most of the Bible um, over the course of a year. There were actually bits that were left out. The book of Revelation, um, for instance, crops up quite rarely um, uh, uh, for interesting reasons. But in any case, th this is one scheme for reading the Bible. Um, in, in, in order like this, here's another, these are other tables um, like this. But another way of reading the Bible is pointed to by George Herbert in a, a poem of his on the Holy Scripture. Um, and he writes, oh, that I knew how all thy lights combine, he's writing about the Bible, and the configurations of their glory, seeing not only how each verse doth shine, but all the constellations of the story. This verse marks that, and both do make a motion unto a third that ten leaves off doth lie. Then as dispersed herbs do watch a potion, these three make up some Christian's destiny. Essentially what he's talking about is, well, I mean, it, this practice of reading is encouraged by early Bibles. This is just a random opening from the book of Jeremiah in the Geneva Bible which was first printed in 1560. It was translated by um, ex-Protestant exiles in Geneva during the reign of Catholic Queen Mary. And some have called it the first um, idiot's guide to the Bible or the first study Bible, because it has such an enormous apparatus. You can see that you know, you've got the two columns of biblical text in the middle, and then on, the, on both sides, you've got thousands and thousands of marginal notes. And a lot of these, um, it may be hard to make out because the text is small, but a lot of these are cross-references. So that readers of the Bible in Shakespeare's day, and, and this is true today too, in a lot of Bibles that you pick up, are encouraged not just to read through, you know, say the book of Jeremiah from beginning to end, or even a section from one chapter to another, but to be continually bouncing around in your Bible uh, according to these various cross-references 
which link you to um, passages that might be similar, passages that might be illuminating for the passage that you're reading. Um, there are any number of different reasons for these cross-references, but I think that's what Herbert is talking about. The reading of the Bible in a way that really, and here's another little sort of playful reference, but I mean, I think the Bible in some ways is the earliest hypertext. Um, it's, it's a book that, I mean, you can read through um, books one, from beginning to end, but it also, in some ways, it's, also, it's sort of waiting for the digital age when all of those cross-references can be turned into hot links and you can just bounce around for the rest of your life from one passage to another um, uh, in what Herbert calls the, uh, the constellation of the story. So, um, into Macbeth then, and some, this is, this is a selection of allusions to Macbeth to, or allusions in Macbeth to the Psalms. Relatively random, but I think we can, you know, I hope they'll all be interesting in themselves and then maybe cohere into something more, um, uh, more significant later on. Duncan, when he first meets or sees Macbeth. Macbeth, we're told early on in the play, is out sort of carving his way through um, hostile, traitorous armies. Um, and when uh, Duncan finally meets him, he's been given rewards already, but he's given more rewards. And Duncan says, welcome hither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing, which is obviously a vegetative or agricultural metaphor. But I think it's one that depends on the first psalm, which is the psalm about the blessed man. Blessed is the man, and he shall be like a tree planted by the waterside that will bring forth his fruit in due season. His leaf also shall not wither, and look whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. Um, it's maybe not a, not a, a clear allusion in terms of the uh, specific language, but the verb to plant is at least uh, connected. And I think that image of prosperity as a matter of planting and growing and nourishing would in fact invoke this psalm for many readers or for many of Shakespeare's audience. This is, a, this is I think, a more obviously biblical passage. When Macbeth is uh, in one of his many soliloquies, um, fretting about whether he is going to or isn't going to go through with the murder of Duncan, he, his language becomes incredibly dense, uh, not only in terms of its allusions and mixed metaphors, um, but even in syntax. Um, and he's imagining the consequences of this action he's considering. And in this quite famous passage, he, he imagines that pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. I mean, the basic idea is pretty straightforward that, you know, the murder will have consequences. Everybody will feel desperately sorry for Duncan. And so um, everything will go badly for Macbeth. But the metaphor is, I mean, what in the world is going on there? It's hard to know, but cherubim at least sends us in a particular direction. Those are those biblical beasts, one of the ranks of angels um, that crop up at different points um, in the Old Testament or in Hebrew scripture. And one of those instances is in Psalm 18, um, which I think has come up before. I was listening to Robert Alter's talk earlier, and he spent some time with this one, I think. Um, but in, uh, this is one verse from Psalm 18. He, that is God, rode upon the cherubims and did fly. He came flying upon the wings of the wind. So whatever else Shakespeare adds to that image, at the core of it is this image from Psalm 18 about God riding on the cherubims and flying on the wings of the wind. Here you can see pity in this case is striding the blast or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air and the tears drowning the wind. There's a, an incredibly complicated elaboration of that psalm verse, but there it is. I'll come back to that later on too. Here's another interesting allusion. Um, uh, Julia mentioned Psalm 137, which is which is one of my obsessions. Um, but happily, it was 
pretty much an obsession of everybody else um, in the early modern period. Lady Macbeth has these incredible speeches and here, and when she's, again, uh, Macbeth is in doubt, hesitating, saying he's not gonna go through with it just after that cherubin's passage. Uh, and, and Lady Macbeth gives him a dressing down and says, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked the nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had I so sworn as you have done to this. I mean, you don't need an illusion to be struck by how horrific that image is, um, a complete violation of any kind of proper, proper motherly love. But I think there's an illusion to Psalm 137 there, which, um, like so many of the Psalms, uh, and I think Robert Alter was pointing this out, uh, that many of the Psalms have different sort of shifts throughout them. And some of them are relatively homogenous, but some of them begin in one mode and change to another mode and then end in quite a different one. Psalm 137 is the famous Psalm of exile, and it begins lamenting the exile of Jews in Babylon. Uh, they've been called on to sing Hebrew songs, but their harps are hung up and they, they can't sing a, a strange song or the Lord's song in a strange land, but it ends with a very powerful and vicious curse. O daughter of Babylon, wasted with misery, <clears throat> excuse me, yea, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Blessed shall he be that taketh thy children and throweth them against the stones. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote, um, I think Julia quoted Lewis early in an earlier talk. He talked about the curses in the Bible. Um, he admired them, but was terrified of them. He said, he said, reading the curses in the Psalms is like walking, walking by uh, an open furnace door and getting blast of heat. Um, one thing that's interesting about this that leads me to something I can talk about. I think it's enough to note that there is this, this very, very striking image of dashing the brains out of little children. I think that's enough for a link. But in this case, the verb is different. Um, uh, well, or actually, hold on, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to that. Um, here's another example, um, a much, much happier Psalm. Um, oh, how amiable are thy dwellings, thou Lord of hosts. My soul hath a desire and longing to enter into the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found her in house, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. Even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be always praising thee. I don't know, many of you may also have... Um, may know lots of, I, I find some of the Psalms are impossible to set, to read without all sorts of music rattling around in my head. The opening of this Psalm uh, it was famously set by uh, Johannes Brahms in his Requiem, and then there are various other um, uh, musical settings of this that rattle through my head. But um, you might not think of this in as, as something that would come up in Macbeth, but there's a curious scene when Duncan is just about to to enter Macbeth's castle. Um, he's rewarded him. He says he's gonna stay with him for the night, which is what provides Macbeth and Lady Macbeth with the opportunity to murder him. But just as he's on the doorstep, there's this little tranquil sort of pastoral scene. And Duncan says, this castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. And Banquo responds, this guest of summer, the temple haunting martlet does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty frieze buttress nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. So everything is, I mean, it's, it's a deeply ironic scene, of course, because they're just about to enter hell. <laughs> you know, they're going through the gate that later on turns into the hell mouth, as the drunken porter puts it. And Duncan is very shortly going to be murdered. Um, one of the things that uh, one of one of the things one can say about Duncan is that he's a pretty thoroughly incompetent judge, not only of character, but of almost everything else. Um, so he's, he's sort of blissfully wandering into his murder. But I think this psalm is very much uh, behind the language here, right? 
the castle castle has a pleasant seat. It's um, it's not the dwellings of the Lord, but it's an amiable dwelling that, uh, at least as Duncan sees it. And what the detail that Banquo adds of this bird that makes its house there and raises its young, the martlet is also um, it's a bird like um, whoop I've gone on too far. It's a bird that's like a swallow. It makes its nest um, in eaves of houses and has a sort of hanging nest. So so. I mean, what they're observing here is that this is an amiable dwelling place and the sparrow has found a house here or the martlet and made a nest where it can lay her young. And but of course, this is a totally ironic illusion. Right. I mean, it adds even more irony to the scene in that this is this is exactly the opposite kind of house to the one that the psalm is describing. This particular passage, um, actually, maybe this is one for for um, for our resident actor. Paul, would you mind reading this for us, Paul Whitworth? Okay. <clears throat> tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Thank you so much. That was definitely the right decision. Um, I mean, that's, it's, it always strikes me, it's always startling to me how short this soliloquy is, given how powerful it is, and how much it lodges in my head. I always imagine that it must be at least twice as long. Um, but it's dense, it's compact. And um, I've sketched this little um, bit out here. In fact, it's a it's one of the things that's uh, that's um, characteristic of it is is that it is an incredibly dense collection of tiny illusions. It's it's a, almost a pastiche of material, especially from the Psalms. So um, the creeping in the tomorrow creeping in its petty pace from day to day. Psalm nineteen two day unto day uttereth speech. All our yesterdays, lighting fools, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday. Um, bring it, thou shalt bring me into the dust of death from Psalm 22, gives the dusty death here. Um, my days are gone. There are a whole series of shadow references that might be relevant to life's but a walking shadow. My days are gone like a shadow. His time passeth away like a shadow. For man walketh like a vain shadow. And then even the fretting is a little bit, I mean, it's it's using the verb in a different sense, but Psalm 39 um, uh, has a verse, thou makest his beauty to consume away like as a moth fretting a garment. And then the tale at the end, we bring our years to an end as, a, as it were a tale that is told. And actually, um, if you add in allusions to other places in the Bible, it gets even more dense. I think when the not the the actual words, but the syntax of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, the threefold repetition reminds me of the famous opening of Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, which is actually surely really what Macbeth is, that's the sort of gist of his soliloquy, that everything is meaningless, everything is vanity. The candle, loud out brief candle, comes from Job, perhaps as among their other possibilities, his candle shall be put out with him um, for our days upon earth or as a shadow, another verse from Job, um, and another tale reference there. Um, so that, so that it's, in this case, I think, it's not so much that, that the audience would necessarily be making all of these individual connections, but I think anybody would, or most of the audience would recognize this as a thoroughly biblical speech, that the, that the, the, the metaphorical language, the imagery is, is rich in um, references to Psalms and other, I mean, this is, this is where Psalms and wisdom literature, I think, overlaps. Um, 
let's see. I don't want to take up too much time here. Um, Psalm 139, uh, let's see, where am I going here? Um, you have plenty of time, Hannibal. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, Psalm 39, I think, is particularly um, important for this, um, this play. And I suppose maybe what I, what I can do is, um, I mean, the, the beauty of a, of a situation like this is that I can make claims that, that I, I might not be willing to make in print, um, hoping that you'll be, uh, you know, you'll go with me, um, even if I can't sort of, you know, I, I, um, Helen Vendler is a, a wonderful critic of poetry as well as, all poetry as well as Shakespeare, um, has a wonderful book on Shakespeare's sonnets where she, she argues that, that he, in, that the sonnets, all of them have key words that that essentially you know that you can almost identify various sonnets in terms of the key words that are threaded through them and i think shakespeare often works that way not just in in terms of key words but maybe in terms of key images or even i think something like key psalms so that i think there are certain psalms that shakespeare has in his head as he's writing macbeth psalm 39 seems to me um one of them particularly in, in that, um, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, fifth verse down, Lord, let me know mine end and the number of my days that I may be certified how long I have to live. Behold, thou hast made my days as it were a span long, and mine age is even as nothing in respect of thee. And verily every man living is altogether vanity. For man walketh in a vain shadow and disquieteth himself in vain. He heapeth up riches. Whoop, and I'm, my, it's vanished under the word. But, it, but I mean, in some ways, that's, that's the gist of Macbeth's soliloquy. And it's also a kind of pervasive mood throughout the play. Um, I think it's also the motivation for Macbeth's second visit to the witches. It's a curious little scene. Well, it's, it's a wonderful scene where, where Macbeth, uh, rather than stumbling across the witches as he and Banquo do earlier on, he actually seeks them out the second time because he needs more information. Um, there's a lot, there's a huge amount of biblical stuff going on here. I think there's, um, people have written about this as a kind of reworking or a version of the um, visit of King Saul to the witch of Endor uh, in 2 Samuel. Uh, but in any case, one thing that's interesting about the scene, among other things, is that Macbeth never actually asks what he wants. He never says why he's there. He has this long preamble here where he says, I conjure you, you know, all these bad things are going to happen. And then to what I ask you, dot, dot, dot. And then um, the witch basically says, you know, the, the, the witch, um, uh, oh, where have I got it? Anyway, um, the witch tells him that, that um, the spirits know what he's going to ask before he even asks it. And so he doesn't have to ask. But I think what he is asking, in fact, is Lord, let me know mine end and the number of my days that I may be certified how long I have to live. I mean, that's really what he really wants to know. What's coming up? What's happening? Just as Saul asked um, the spirit of Samuel via the witch of Endor, he's facing, he's facing battle. Um, the uh, Philistine armies are surrounding them. Um, what's going to happen tomorrow? How are things going to go? Macbeth similarly wants to know what's going to happen. Um, and so that Psalm verse, I think, uh, is again, somewhere, um, somewhere in the background, subtly enough. Um, here's another wonderful Psalm that I think has come up in one of your earlier sessions or, or more. Um, as I recall, um, Sean likes this one in particular, and it's, it's a brilliant one. Lord, thou hast been our refuge from one generation to another. Um, and it starts out very confidently and, and full of praise and, and a sense that, that God has supported um, his people. But then it turns, um, thou turnest man to destruction as soon as for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, seeing that is past as a watch in the night. As soon as thou scatterest them, they are even as asleep and fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and groweth up, 
but in the evening it is cut down, dried up, and withered. And so again, in this mode of the transitoriness of life, for when thou art angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end, as it were, a tale that is told. That's that verse that I think is behind one of the lines, the, uh, the tale told by an idiot in the soliloquy. But then this um, another verse that's often excerpted, the days of our age are three score years and 10. And though men be so strong that they, they come to four score years, oh, where is it? Okay. Um, they come to four score years, yet is their strength then but labor and sorrow. So soon it passeth away and we are gone. And here, this, um, there's a scene with, uh, with an old man, uh, Lennox, and an old man talking about all sorts of weird things that have happened um, as a result of the sort of the, the cosmic order has been disrupted after Duncan's murder, um, even to the point where his horses eat each other, which is rather bizarre. But the old man begins his um, account by saying three score and 10 I can remember well, it's a proverbial saying, but it actually evokes the same psalm that pops up in other contexts. So I think, again, Psalm 90 is one that's rattling around in Shakespeare's head through this play. Um, one interesting thing about the allusions to the Bible in this period is that because the Bible is so pervasive, and the psalms uh, all the more so, throughout the culture, Allusions also often sort of invoke multiple texts so that so that an allusion to the Psalms or to another biblical text might might come not directly from the Bible, but secondhand by way of another text. And this is the burial service um, from the Book of Common Prayer, which is itself composed of multiple biblical verses. Man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He flieth as it were a shadow and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life, we be in death. And then that famous phrase, we therefore commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Those are biblical that's biblical language, but it is very familiar to Shakespeare and his contemporaries from the burial service, which associates these various passages with death. Um, uh, do I have this there? Yeah. Um, so here, for instance, um, the second apparition uh, in that, that amazing scene where Macbeth is getting his, his prophecies from these, from these strange spirits, one of them comes up and says, be bloody, bold, and resolute, laugh to scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. And then Macbeth starts riffing on this. So oh, where's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? And this that comes up again and again and again throughout the play. Um, Macbeth kills young Seward and then says, ha, thou wast born of woman. Um, and um, that that is, Macbeth fixates on that language None of woman born shall harm Macbeth. He thinks it's a matter of security. He thinks it's perfect security because, of course, since everybody is born of a woman, that must mean that nobody can harm him. Um, however, if he were cognizant of the origin of that phrase, I mean, it comes in the burial service, but it originates, originates in Job. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. The real lesson of this um, verse is that is, is not a, it's, it's not a, an assurance of life, it's an assurance of death. Um, and of course, because of the witches and their tricky ways, um, it turns out to be a game as well, because he finds out, I mean, as, as you know from the play, that, that um, Macbeth right up until the end, thinks that he's invulnerable, but then Macduff tells him that he was actually um, ripped, untimely ripped from his mother's womb. Turns out he's the one person not born of a woman. Now, it's a bit of a hedge, I don't know. It seems to me that's still a kind of birth. But um, anyway, it's, it's, it's an interesting case where, where the illusion, um, I think Macbeth has to be unaware that this is an illusion. That's my sense. But he's certainly unaware of the larger context of the illusion, that it's not, in fact, a verse about, um, about the security of life, but about its insecurity. 
Um, this gets, uh, this comes back to my question about, um, I, I'm interested, uh, Julia mentioned my anthology, which has, which brings together, you know, dozens and scores of, of different Psalm translations. And there were many, many translations of the Psalms circulating in Shakespeare's day. This verse, this allusion that I mentioned, I, as I said, the, there's a slight awkwardness in that if, if I'm making the case for an allusion, it's a different verb. Lady, in Lady Macbeth's speech, um, sh she would have dashed the brains out of these children. In Psalm 137, uh, blessed shall he be that throweth them against the stones. Um, there's the, there's the, that's my clever, clever use of um, <laughs> PowerPoint. Um, but in fact, the language actually comes from a different version of the Psalms. I've been using the Miles Coverdale translation from the Book of Common Prayer. This is um, the whole book of Psalms, a metrical version of the Psalms by Sternhold, Hopkins, and various others that was sung in churches throughout England for 150 years, one of the most widely known versions, but from in a different context. There are different kinds of poems. Here, for instance, you can see um, uh, this, this is the verse from Psalm 137. Even so shalt thou, O Babylon, at length to dust be brought, and happy shalt thou man, that man be called that our revenge hath wrought. Yea, blessed shall that man be called that taketh thy children young to dash their bones against hard stones which lie the streets among. So in this version of the Psalms, not perhaps the greatest poetry, but there's a greater verbal similarity to Lady Macbeth's speech. Um, I sus I, I'm not necessarily arguing that Shakespeare had this version in his head. It may be that he had a kind of composite um, and liked the verb to dash, um, which is a little stronger um, than simply the verb to throw. Um, and this gets me into, I mean, as Julia pointed out, my first book was called Psalm Culture uh, and Early Modern English Literature. And Psalm Culture has to do with this sort of swirl of different psalm texts in different places throughout 16th and 17th century culture. Um, there were, of course, lots of Bibles in circulation. At the left-hand side of the screen here is the Geneva Bible, which was the most popular by far um, for um, personal reading or family Bibles, though it was never authorized for use in churches. At the right-hand side of the screen is the Bishop's Bible, which was used in churches from uh, 1568. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer, which was pretty much uh, in, in sort of the same state throughout Shakespeare's lifetime, had a different translation of the Psalms in it by Miles Coverdale. And then Sternhold and Hopkins, this whole book of Psalms, was first printed in 1562 and then in countless editions thereafter. And that had yet another version of the Psalms. And this is only the tip of the iceberg. Um, on the left, the Vulgate Bible was still kicking around continuously in print. There were various other paraphrases. One of my favorites is William Hunnis's Seven Sobs of a Sorrowful Soul for Sin. He was quite fond of alliteration. Um, Calvin's commentary on the Psalms um, was translated into English by Arthur Golding, and Golding translated the Psalms into a new prose version for that. So not only would uh, readers of this book be reading Calvin's commentaries, but they'd be reading Golding's version of the Psalms. And then at the right-hand side of the screen is the Psalm, one of the Psalms of uh, Philip Sidney, and these circulated like many others did in manuscript throughout the period. So there are dozens and dozens of different versions of the Psalms kicking around. Some, of, I mean, in some cases, I mean, similar and different. I mean, it's it's it is a sort of rich, saturated Psalm culture. And so here, this is my little fun exercise, <laughs> if it is spotting Psalms in Macbeth. So. Um, and spotting because Lady Macbeth says out damn spot. Um, most editions, I don't, I haven't seen an edition of, of this play which mentions this as a possibility, but um, I think this comes from Psalm 51. And uh, this translation wouldn't do very well in making my case. It's a wonderful verse, it's a popular verse, thou shalt purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean, thou shalt wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And it sort of vaguely connects to Lady Macbeth's um, sort of uh, 
mentally ill desire to to cleanse herself of the blood that's staining her. But again, if you go to the whole book of Psalms, in this case, it's William Whittingham's metrical version, and read this, the verse in this translation, if thou with hyssop purge this blot, I shall be cleaner than the glass. And if thou wash away my spot, the snow in whiteness, I shall pass. And so, In this version of the psalm, which, as I say, was as popular as any in the period, the stain, the sin that David prays to be cleansed of is a spot. And so when Lady Macbeth fixates on a spot, I think it's not unreasonable to say that Psalm 51 is in the background there, especially since as Julia, I think, pointed out um, in one of your earlier sessions, Psalm 51 is the quintessential text for the forgiveness of sins, for the penitent sinner. And that is essentially, I mean, Lady Macbeth um, is, is wanting cleansing, but of course she's, um, she's hardly penitent. But anyway, I think this is a, an interesting connection here. Um, also interesting, I think, that earlier on in Psalm 51, in the beginning verse, what is David praying for um, in the British, or in the um, um, Coverdale version, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, that wonderful coinage of Coverdale's. This is the psalm about blood guilt. Um, and so, of course, it's, in, it's stuck in Lady Macbeth's head, um, and her spot isn't just any ordinary sinful spot, but it really is blood guiltiness, uh, just as Macbeth's is. Um, so here I come back, and, and I'll, I'll close quickly, because um, I know that some may have questions. Um, my claim for the sort of, for, for lack of arbitrariness in this connection, in this title of mine, is that I think um, one of the things that interests me about Macbeth is, is, this, is, is the fact that there's this pervasive tone of apocalypse in the play. Um, that's my connection to Strange Love because it's about a nuclear apocalypse. But um, there's so many scenes in the play where things are represented apocalyptically. In the murder of, of Duncan is, is described as great the great doom's image, um, which, which alludes to images like this, which is the, the doom or the last judgment from the Guild Chapel Church uh, in, in Shakespeare's Stratford. Um, it also connects, and here I'm, I'm really just sort of give, throwing out some things that, that I could talk about more, but um, I think the, that Shakespeare's representation of, of an apocalyptic world in Macbeth is also connected to a contemporary sense of apocalypse due to an apocalyptic moment in 1605 when Guy Fawkes and various conspirators in what's known as the gunpowder plot tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament and with it, with them basically the entire ruling class of England. This was seen as an apocalyptic event, and I think there are all sorts of interesting connections uh, with Shakespeare's Macbeth, which some critics have, have delved into uh, more than I have. Earthquakes, cherubins, this gets back to Psalm 18 here, which I think has a very apocalyptic tone. That verse about riding the cherubims happens in the midst of smoke and trembling of the earth and thunder out of heaven um, and so forth. Um, I'll f- let, let me finish up there. Um, that's, uh, I, could, I could ramble on about the apocalypse forever, um, but uh, I, I hope I've at least uh, offered some things of interest and I'd be happy to, to talk further, answer any other questions if anybody has some. Thank you. That was great. I was just furiously taking notes. So I'm hoping that you will share your PowerPoint with me so I can sure, get more of to. that. It was just um, a revelation to see uh, <laughs> an apocalypse <laughs> um, to see you work through um, so many passages and just show kind of how one identifies these allusions and what kinds of meanings they can start to yield when we look at them with care, as well as the book history and the um, cultural history, the performance history of the time. Um, I imagine we have some, uh, Kirk Davis has a question. Indeed we do. (laughs) Uh, Professor Hamlin, thank you so much for a brilliant lecture. Too short, we'll have to get your books from Langston Library. (laughs) Uh, Question, in your reading of Shakespeare and his use of the Bible, 
Do you have a sense in any way that he was actually internally a religious person? Was he using the Bible because he loved it so much, or was he using the Bible because it was a useful set of illusions for a poet and a playwright? It's, I mean, my hunch is both, uh, but it's uh, it's very, very difficult to, I, I mean, um, there's a wonderful, um, a wonderful assessment about uh, or a comment on Shakespeare's sexuality by um, critic Stephen Booth. Um, you know, the, the question has been batted back and forth. You know, uh, and Booth Booth wrote that that Shakespeare was almost certainly homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. Um, <laughs> And and it, that's it seems to me that's the sort of thing that we'd have to say about uh, about his religious beliefs. We don't really all the evidence we have is the plays, and and the plays don't. I think. I mean, my sense is that is that Shakespeare. I don't think he was he was particularly partisan. Um, I'm not convinced by arguments for his Catholicism, but I'm not. I don't think he was anti-Catholic. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of recent religious history of the period has has recognized the extent to which individual faith was much more complicated. Sort of Catholic lining up on one side and Protestants on the other. Um, it's it's a mix and and muddle. I suspect that. She, I mean, one thing I I do feel confident saying is that I think Shakespeare takes both the Bible and religious ideas and practice very seriously. Um, I can't really begin to say what he believed. Um, and, and of course, it may have changed from day to day, um, just as everybody's does. Um, or, or from, you know, I mean, he writes in the context, I mean, he's in, in different plays, you know, I mean, if, if he's writing a, a, a tragedy like Macbeth, He's exploring very dark apocalyptic ideas. I suggest that he's exploring skeptical ideas in King Lear, but in other plays, um, uh, especially say the later romances, there seems to be much more of a sense of, of confidence or faith or, or a kind of acknowledgement of, of the mystical or mysterious. Um, so I think, I, 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 I think he was serious in his approach to religion. I think he was he was in, deeply engaged with not only the Bible but religious I, ideas, debates, and texts. But I don't think I can say precisely what what he believed, um, one way or another. This question keeps coming up. It clearly is something of <laughs> great interest. <laughs> Probably all of our speakers will get a version of this question, and maybe we'll have found our way to. <laughs> Some settlement with the question, at least by the end of our, our time. Today. Hannibal, Hannibal, can I ask you a question about psalm culture, which I think is a really useful and wonderful concept? I, I assume you would agree that we are no longer in the kind of psalm culture that Shakespeare found himself in and wrote his works in. We're not saturated with them um, on a sort of a society-wide level in the way that his, his period was. So... Um, I wonder what you think is the main consequence of that for modern audiences and modern productions of Shakespeare's works. What What is different about our understanding of Shakespeare now in general, given that we are no longer immersed in the psalm culture that you've been describing and showing is such an important dimension of his work? That's a, that's a wonderful question. I mean, I think... I think we've lost a great deal. I mean, we've lost a lot in terms of classical reference too, or, or topical references from the 16th or 17th centuries. And 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 I I, I think you know the more we the more we recapture that, the the richer uh, the sense we have of the plays. I think. Um, uh, I think again. I think Julia mentioned in, a, in one of the earlier sessions the the um, wonderful. Um, chapel scene in Hamlet where Claudius um, seems to be praying, at least Hamlet thinks he is, but actually we find out he's not. And his, there, there are powerful allusions again to Psalm 51 in, that, in his speech, which essentially make him a, a kind of, I mean, they, they draw him into parallel with the penitent David, um, who was also a murderer, um, and, and yet, force a contrast too. And I think the, uh, you know, the, that scene is just less 
I mean, it, it's not as if it's uninteresting or ineffective, ineffective without the illusion, but it adds a richness um, that, that I think the original audience would surely have had. Um, and I, it's, I don't know, I remember, I remember talking about this at some point, OSC, Ohio State used to have a, we had a brief fling with the Royal Shakespeare Company um, <laughs> at one point that didn't quite turn into anything, but Greg Doran was here for a, um, a round table. And I remember talking to him about, you know, wh whether it is, how it is that, for instance, in a theater, one might recapture some sense of that elusive context. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure um, whether there's some means of, I don't know whether you, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's very hard to know. I mean, it's, it's, um, as you were saying, that song culture was so pervasive and so, so easy to tap into. I mean, the fact that everybody was supposed to be, you know, legally required to go to church every Sunday and they went to the same church and they had the same Bible and the same lessons and the same liturgy. I mean, that's a, that's a kind of common culture that we have. I mean, there's nothing resembling that today. Even the most popular, popular culture doesn't, isn't that pervasive. Harry Potter, the Bible of the millennial. Oh. <laughs> pervasive. Um, we have time. We usually end at one o'clock and then we continue with our after party for another 15 minutes. So we can take one more question from the floor uh, or comment. There's a lot of interesting comments in the chat as well. If someone would like to raise their hand um, okay, or continue this discussion here of kind of what we've lost and what we gained or how to, I mean, I, I think the, the study is really important. And that's why both of our Shakespeare centers, we support our summer festivals and we try to do that by providing opportunities for study so that when people enter the theater, they have a little bit more of that layered experience. Of course, we have to choose what it is that you know we wanna share. Uh, there's so much, um, but I think you know, study is really key and study and community is really key. And I know Sean, uh, K2, yes. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for a wonderful talk and pointing out the allusions. I think that, you know, just as with the richness of Shakespeare and adding this knowledge, you know, heightens our reading or our viewing pleasure, this would be in a way similar to, you know, I, I'm kind of, I teach African drama. And if you teach a playwright like Wallace Schoenk, who got the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. for Literature, but reading his play, Death and the King's Horseman, needs so much cultural illusion that, you know, the play can stand on its own. And yet for students to really get into it, to enjoy it, to understand it, to interpret it, they would need some of this layering. And so I, I just wanted to say that this may be a factor for many, many great writers and perhaps even within non-Western traditions, you know, in terms of how we how we approach drama. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I was just teaching um, Death and the King's Horseman this past term. So I know exactly what you mean since I was desperately trying to figure out what's going on. Um, but you're absolutely right, I think, you know, that whether it's whether it's um, Protestant Christianity or, or your religious belief and practice, um, these works become richer the more we know about their contexts and background. Great. Well, it's one o'clock, so if people need to leave, they're welcome to do so. They're always welcome to do so, of course. Uh, and we do have Shana Trepido coming next week from Yeshiva University. So we're trying to move between Hebrew and Christian scripture and traditions in terms of what, what, what the Psalms have meant with always uh, the emphasis on Shakespeare. Um, so please do come back uh, next week for Shana. And we wanna just thank Hannibal and then we'll stay and have a little more time with him. <laughs>